Well, one day a father uh, was listening to his teenage children make their case for permission to watch a PG-13 movie that all of their friends were watching. It's rated PG-13, Dad, just because of a little suggestion of sex, the older daughter said. But they never really show anything too bad. The younger daughter said, and Dad, the Lord's name is used as a swear word only three times in the whole movie. <laughs> then the son added, there's some violence, but, but just the normal killing and stuff like that. Father listened to all this. His answer was no. <laughs> and needless to say, the kids were not pleased. Later in the evening, the father came into the room where the teens were glumly watching TV, and in his hand was a plate of homemade brownies. The kids perked up just a little bit. They dug into the brownies with great delight. After they had taken a few bites, their father very calmly explained that he had taken their favorite brownie recipe and added a new ingredient, just a tiny bit of dog poop. Oh. Soon the air was filled with brownies being spit out everywhere as the teens reacted with disgust. Of course, the father was clearly making the point that even the tiniest amount of impurity is too much. Today, we focus on living lives that pursue purity and contain as little dog poop as possible as we progress in blessing. Our roots are in place. The shoot is growing tall and straight and fruit is being produced. Last week we talked about mercy. Today we look at purity as we progress in blessings that Jesus wants us to have. Would you pray with me? Father, as we open your word this morning, I pray that even in these unsettled times, we would be allowing your spirit to make us into the people that you want us to be. May the words that I'm about to speak and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts, would they be pleasing and acceptable to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Even today, we have Bibles for you. If you'd like to borrow one, please raise your hand. If you don't have one at home, we would like to make this our gift to you. We are on the sixth beatitude today. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. It's on page 579 of those Bibles that we hand out. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. I want to begin by clearing away the most common misconception of this beatitude. Pure in heart does not mean sinlessness. Did you hear that? Pure in heart does not mean sinlessness. If it did, Nobody would ever see God. No one would ever be able to be blessed by this attitude. In this life, followers of Jesus are always sinners in the process of recovery. We can grow. We can make progress. But the Bible is very clear. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Being pure in heart does not mean that we've never had a bad thought or that we've never made a bad choice. <laughs> Boy, I hope that comes as a big as a relief to some of you as it does to me. Being pure in heart in this beatitude means that God calls us to pursue holiness. We're never going to be holy like God is holy, but he wants us to nonetheless be pursuing his holiness. The Bible says, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit, and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. 
warning. We're not pursuing holiness so that we get to spend eternity with Jesus as a reward. We are declared holy when we say yes to following Jesus. We are declared holy when we accept him as our Savior. We are guaranteed admittance into his presence right now and as well as when we take our final breath. But in obedience, we wholeheartedly pursue holiness. We wholeheartedly pursue the living of our life, avoiding sin, and in pursuit of holy living. And that's the key here. Being wholehearted rather than a divided heart. Being pure in heart means we have a unified heart. In his book, The Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan has a character called Mr. Facing Both Ways. Mr. Facing Both Ways has been described by one writer as the person with one eye on heaven and one eye on earth. This guy sincerely believes one thing and sincerely does another thing. And he's unable to see the contradiction in all of this. Prophet Elijah, he saw exactly the same thing when he had gathered God's people at Mount Carmel. He saw them trying to have their cake and eating it too. He saw them living with one foot enjoying the sinful world and the other foot trying to stay in God's good graces. So Elijah asked him, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. Elijah was challenging them to have a unified heart. God's people had been facing in two directions. They wanted the blessings of God, but they kept on worshiping idols. Don't we also need to hear Elijah's challenge to us today? How long will we hobble between two opinions? How long will we go on trying to follow Jesus and enjoying just a little tiny bit of the evil that the world has to offer? How long will we continue toying with the same sins but never quite willing to give them up? And giving ourselves completely to pursuing purity with a unified heart. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he means it will be an undivided heart, a unified heart, a heart that is pulling in only one direction, the direction of holiness. Well, this picture may be a little bit difficult to look at. <laughs> It very accurately shows a divided heart. Which direction will this person go? Which eye will this person follow? Picture an Olympic sprinter, laser focused on the finish line as they charge down the track. A great sprinter will won't even glance to the left or the right. Because they know that even the slightest distraction, the slightest movement, will cost them a fraction of a second. And it could prove fatal to them winning the race. The excellent runner's focus has a singular focus, not a double focus. The, the runner's mind and body are fully aligned in the pursuit of a goal. Remember, purity of heart is not perfection, but it is pursuing wholeheartedly 
with a unified heart, the avoidance of sin. Colin Smith says, purity of heart does not lie in what we attain, but in what we pursue and how we pursue it. James picks up on this purity and single-mindedness. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Good words for today. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. This whole process, this pursuit, takes extremely radical and severe measures. Our hearts must be completely withdrawn from the competitors of God and given completely without holding back to the only one who has a right to our heart, the only one who has paid the ransom for our hearts, the one who has died so that he could give us a pure and unified heart. Being pure in heart means we have a forgiven heart. One of the great benefits of being followers of Jesus is that we are put in a position where all charges against us are dropped. While our sins kept us separated from God, when we ask Jesus to be our Savior and we are no longer enemies of God, now we become his dearly loved children. The reason that followers of Jesus will enter heaven when we die is not because we're without sin, but rather that God no longer charges the penalty for our sins to our account. We've been totally forgiven, completely forgiven. In that great sin ledger in heaven, instead of our sin being charged to our own personal accounts, our sin gets put on Jesus' tab. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, all our sins were judged. All our sins were punished and atoned for once and for all. Isaiah 53 tells us the Lord laid on him. That him is Jesus. The sins of us all. A confidence to stand before God when this life is over does not rest on the quality of how we have lived. Although that is important, our confidence is in the work of Jesus on the cross who paid the debt in full. In Jesus, our sin debt has been paid in full so that our sin will not and cannot be charged against us on the day of judgment. In confidence, we will enter heaven with the judgment of forgiven stamped on our forehead. This is the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If you have never sealed this deal with the Lord and ask Jesus to be your Savior and forgive you, don't let today pass without doing just that. <coughs> because the benefits just keep coming. Being pure in heart also means that we have a cleansed heart. When we have a relationship with Jesus, God washes us clean as freshly fallen snow, which I hope we will not see anymore this season. <laughs> But can, it's important for us to remember, anyway, what that looks like. This forgiveness and cleansing, they are inseparably linked. Maybe you noticed I didn't finish 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Some translations say all unrighteousness. Those God forgives, he also cleanses. Twin blessings that belong to all who follow Jesus. But there's an important difference between these two blessings. Re reconciliation with God through forgiveness happens once. When we, are a when, when we are a follower of Jesus, while sin does interfere with our relationship with him, 
we do not once again become his enemy every time we mess up. That's why it's so important for us to understand this cleansing. Because cleansing is something we need on a continuing basis. We need it for the rest of our lives. Our hearts need continual cleansing because we get messed up. We get messed up with greed and lust and pride and other sins as we give in to them. One author says that he has met many people over the years who say that they believe Jesus forgives them, but they struggle to believe that they can be cleansed. This author tells the story of a man who is a composite of many encounters that he has had over the years. With sadness in his eyes, this man says, Pastor, you have to realize that I've got baggage. Real bad baggage. Over the years, I've done things that I wish I had never done. I've thought things that I wish I had never thought. My thinking, my feeling, my desiring, they're messed up. My thinking is so distorted and twisted that it has led to patterns of compulsive behavior from which I cannot free myself. This man is a follower of Jesus. He believes that God can forgive him, but he can't imagine ever being cleansed of his sin, being freed from his sin. It's, it's impossible for him to grasp. <clears throat> Maybe this idea is prevailing in some of your minds this morning. Maybe you don't really believe that God can do anything about the baggage that you carry in your heart. If this is true, you've got some hard things to say. It means that you are not trusting the Savior who came not only to forgive your sins, but also to totally cleanse your heart from these sins. Let's see if scripture backs up this idea. I don't want to just talk it off my head. That we are forgiven and cleansed. Matthew 121. You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Our sins include habits, compulsions, and ingrained behaviors of thought, thought and behavior, ingrained patterns of thought and behavior. Jesus came not only to save us from the guilt and consequences of sin, but from the sins themselves. He came to deliver us from the power that sin exercises over us. And how about Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration. Jesus washes and restores our hearts. That means he gives us new desires, new interests, new inclinations, new energy to live in purity. Over time, we find ourselves hating the sin we used to love. Sins that have held us in their grip will lose their power. Our defeats, our failures will be fewer, and our strength in the battle against temptation will grow. You see, the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I trust God to cleanse me and free me from sin's power? <coughs> if we answer yes to this question, it becomes a stepping stone and will help us move forward path to cleansing begins with the statement, if I am in Christ and he is in me, I believe he can cleanse this heart of mine. Amen. 
But being pure in heart doesn't let us off the hook. It means that we are actively engaged in striving for purity. While there are many ways that we can be involved in this process, I want to highlight three of them this morning. First, we need to trust that God will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. When we feel that temptations are too strong, we feel that our failures are too many, our wounds are too deep, and our progress is too slow, we've got to keep our focus. We've got to keep our focus on Jesus who promises to cleanse us. We must put our trust in God. There's an account in the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus and his disciples were crossing a lake in a boat, a storm came up and it was so severe that even the seasoned fishermen feared for their lives. Jesus calmed the storm by speaking a word. It showed his authority over the wind and the waves. And then he asked his disciples, who were freaking out, he asked them a question. Where is your faith? Now, these disciples, they had left everything to follow Jesus. The problem was that right here, in this moment, they were not trusting Jesus for this particular challenge in this storm. For some of you, for some of us. The pursuit of purity is a storm. Where do you need to exercise faith that God will bring purity into your life right now? Maybe it's a struggle with pride. Maybe it's a struggle with lust. Maybe it's fear. Where is your faith? Whatever your particular nagging sin is, you may have bat been battling with this sin for your whole life. You've often felt defeated. But today is different. Make today different. Because Jesus calls us to trust him, even in this pursuit of purity. Jesus is able. Jesus is able to bring about great changes in us and, like we say every week, transform us. But he also calls us to be actively engaged in this process. And that engagement begins with trust. Trust that he will do it. Another way to be actively involved in the change process is to dive into God's word. Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church, that's us, and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing, hear it? Washing of water with the word. The Bible is as essential to our pursuit of purity as water is essential to taking a bath. The Bible tells us how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Over time, the effect of immersing ourselves in God's word is going to be like the effect of soapy water in, on dirty clothes in a washing machine. As the machine agitates, the stain is slowly and gradually loosened from the fabric. Over time, the word of God will have this same cleansing effect, even on the toughest stains in our lives. As we pursue purity, we must immerse 
ourselves in the Bible. The Word of God will bring about this cleansing that we so desperately need. We must seize every opportunity we can do to do this. Feeding on God's Word privately or in small groups, hearing the Word preached or listening to other great teachers giving great spiritual insights. We read and we listen expectantly, applying what we hear and read so that we can believe what God says and obey what he tells us to do. Next, we must get back up after a fall. Micah said, do not gloat over me, my enemies, for though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Nobody, nobody, nobody makes uninterrupted progress on this path of purity. We all fall at times. When you set out to battle against sins, that have taken up residence in your heart, there will be stumbling, there will be falling. The battle for purity, it's a lifelong struggle. It's a marathon rather than a sprint. And perseverance is the key to success. You see, every time we say yes to sin, what happens? We increase sin's power in our lives. And it makes the next temptation harder to resist. But every time we say no to sin, we weaken its power. We must persevere in the fight through God's empowerment. And only through God's empowerment will we win more rounds than we lose. It might help to think of our pursuit, pursuit of purity in terms of a football game. Every time we say no to sin, the ball moves forward. Every time we say yes to sin, yards are lost. Pretty soon, we end up being back on the defensive. And we have also got to be very careful when we're gaining yards in a drive. And we think we're doing really well, sin can step in again and snatch the ball, and pretty soon the <coughs> ball is in the other end zone before we even know it. And when we put points on the board, that's when we need to be on the defense. Because sin is going to try to lure us back. I think the most important thing that this football example teaches us is this. When sin has broken through our defenses and scored a touchdown, we must not be tempted to leave the game. We must not be tempted to quit. It's not the time for it. It's time to begin a new drive against sin so that this ball by God's empowerment, can start moving forward once again. Which brings us to the final benefit of a pure heart. Being pure in heart means that we will see God. The more we grow in purity, the more we will see God. We will see him as we trust him in this process more and more each day. We'll see him in his word. We'll see him as we feel him picking us up when we fall. And we get back into the game. We must relentlessly pursue purity. We must not settle for just a little tiny bit of dog poop in our brownies. We must not settle for just a little bit of sin in our lives, we must pursue a pure heart because then we will see God. Now on this side of eternity, we see God through the eyes of faith. But when he comes again, 
or when he calls us home to be with him, we will see him face to face. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your promises of power and strength as we pursue purity in our lives. Help us always, Lord, to keep a singular focus on this, a focus so intent on you that all distractions fade away. Lord, impurity has so many consequences. You don't want that for us. You want us to experience life with you in your presence right now. That doesn't happen when we give in to sin. So Lord, bless us this week as we may be tempted to give in to fear, as we may be tempted to other things. Lord, you are there with us, empowering us, with us, giving us peace and joy, even in troubled times, even in times of temptation. So Lord, help us to keep our minds clear, our eyes focused on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.